Dear Gwitch everyone, Kojima Tashiv and welcome back to episode number 69 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, Inline G. <laughs> I cannot help myself. Oh, how's it going lads? Or should I say... Bonjour, comment allez-vous, hein? Because, my petit rat, we are back off to France this week. Another French special. So listen, if you're new to this podcast, first of all, don't turn off. I know that was a lot to take for the first 30 seconds of a podcast, but stick with me. I promise it gets better. But if it's your first time here, first of all, come on in. Thank you for stopping by. The water is lovely. Thank you for being here. But you might not know how much of a Francophile I am on this podcast. I lived and studied in Paris and I miss it dearly with all my heart. Uh, Although I did realise recently that out of all the countries I've lived in, France is now the one that I've spent the least amount of time in. Which breaks my heart because I feel so attached to France. I've been in Germany for six long years, man got. I was in Cardiff for four years. Obviously I lived in Ireland for 18 years and then I left when I was 18. But France, a mere three years. But it's in my heart. And next week, I'm going back to Paris. Because i got all my mates there and I love seeing them. And when I did that episode on the French flute school and the general thing, it was because I was going to Paris. And I got motivated and it got me thinking of all things Francais. And that's what's happened again, lads. So I've done another episode. And I will be podcasting while I'm in Paris. So stay tuned for some very special guests. But... While I was there, I thought, I'll get into the old Google, see what's going on in and around Al Gay Paris while I'm there. Now, Paris, it is built up for flute players as this mythical mecca place, especially for people who haven't been there yet. They're like, oh my god, it's Paris, we have to go, it's for the flute. But you have to be careful. You don't want to build it up too much because you'll end up like those Japanese lads. So, because flute players often do end up like these Japanese lads. There is a thing, genuinely, you can look this up, there is a thing called a psychological phenomenon called Paris syndrome. Now, I'll give you the official definition of this. Paris syndrome is a psychological condition primarily experienced by some tourists, especially those from Japan, when they visit Paris. It involves intense disappointment or shock upon realizing that the city doesn't meet their idealized or romanticized expectations. Now, the Japanese embassy reports at least every single year 20 cases minimum of Paris syndrome or something that requires psychological or medical assistance due to what I just described. Now, individuals suffering from Paris syndrome, they can have emotional distress, including depression, disillusionment, and anxiety. A lot of them actually need immediate repatriation off to Japan. And because these cases have been quite well documented, it has now become a notable psychological phenomenon called Paris syndrome. Now, the most famous example of that was back in 2002. There was a young woman, unnamed, because it was this was reported in a medical journal, so it was only for research purposes. But she came over to Paris expecting charming cafes, stylish locals, iconic landmarks, all the wonderful things. And here is the bit from this medical journal. It says, as her expectations continued to be shattered, she started experiencing severe psychological symptoms. Her anxiety spiraled into paranoia and she became convinced that people in the city, including hotel staff and passerby, were plotting against her. She began suffering from hallucinations, believing she was being persecuted at the break at the sorry, I shouldn't laugh. At the peak of her breakdown, she lost her sense of identity and felt detached from reality, a common symptom of depersonalization, often associated with severe emotional distress. I know it's not funny, it's not funny, but God help you if you're running about Paris thinking they've all got it out for you. Now, this happens to a lot of Japanese tourists, especially because Japan and Paris have always had strong links. Historically, they had, like, big trade agreements, like, back in the 18th century. But later it became, they share a lot of ideas locally, or locally, culturally. A lot of ideals, culturally, sort of blend between the two very easily. For example, they have a shared love of aesthetics in general and art. So, for example, the Japanese people would look at France and say, that is the world capital of philosophy. And literature and art and class and poetry while the french would look at the japanese as the the epitome of elegance and precision and beauty especially when they look at things like their tea ceremonies or their floral arrangements or the zen approach to things and there's a lot of 
hanky panky going on between the two countries a lot of japanese women will come to france looking for this suave educated smelling lovely french man who has a lovely scarf on and he takes her to the opera while a lot of dirty wee french men go over to paris looking to get some submissive wee japanese girl because one thing you learn about france very quickly is french men are stinky wee rats they're stinky wee rats Mwah. i always say my favorite phrase is j'aime la france mais sans les français i like france but without the french but i actually remember one time my friends came in to visit me in paris never been in paris before got off the flight from belfast which is hardly the most beautiful city in the world either. And you get the flight, you get the train straight from Charles de Gaulle Airport to Gare du Nord, Gare du Nord. And they got off the train there. I met them there because I lived in that direction. And as we got off the train, we were walking up. Gare du Nord is the biggest station in Paris, but one of the most disgusting as well. And as I was walking up the stairs, I don't know how to describe it, but we saw a poo and we just knew it was human. I don't know how. We just looked at it and thought, that did not come from beast that came from man and that is that is paris in a nutshell you think you're going to see great things you see a poo and you go oh god let's get out of here so paris isn't all it's cracked up to be and it is a tough place to live and this is a very common thing especially with american tourists who come over for flute tourism that is a thing it's not as widespread as normal tourism quote unquote but it is a thing people come over wanting to see all these historical sites that they've heard about in these french books about the flute and they're often quite disappointed in what the city's got to offer. Now, in general, you have to remember, Paris is dirty, okay? It's a dirty as fuck city. It's expensive. It is cramped, okay? The bars, the hotels, the restaurants, no matter where you go, you're squeezed up. It is not suited to the larger gentlemen. And Parisians are, quote-unquote, rude. I don't think they're rude, personally. I think the crack with Parisians is they have to live their normal lives there. And anyone and everyone in Paris is stressed all the time. Everyone's doing big jobs, and we have to get through the Paris metro, and we're doing shit. We, I don't live there anymore, but when I did. And just because you're on your holidays and want to slow everyone else down doesn't mean the world stops for you. That's the kind of attitude. So Parisians have their stuff to do. But in general, this all builds into this general air of disappointment. Now, people come over for the flute and they're thinking, great, I'm in the world capital for flute. There'll be flute concertos every week. There'll be recitals every day. There'll be a Mozart flute quartet on every single corner. Because there's a lot of great flute players living in Paris, which is True, there is an obscene amount of incredible flute players in the city, but like anywhere else, they're all fighting over the same scraps that are left behind, apart from a few at the top jobs. The arts in France are doing well, but under the Macron administration, they have seen a lot of drops in funding and a lot of smaller organizations and ensembles have disappeared, and there's been rumors of the bigger ones either going or amalgamating. Now, Paris, generally speaking, stays okay relatively it doesn't get hit too hard by these things compared to the rest of france paris is paris but there is one thing the french have that keeps all this alive which i love this about france i was amazed that this is offered in ireland we don't have this but there is a status in france called intermittent du spectacle translating that it's sort of like intermittent intermittent performer or something like that so basically it's it's good old socialist france invented this it was a scheme that they invented back in the day, and it is still there, and it's designed for people who are in the gig economy of the performing arts. So if you're a performing musician who survives by doing a concert here and a concert there, but you don't know where your next project's coming from, you're involved in that. But also people like stage designers, technicians, anyone who's making their income from a gig economy in the performing arts. That's it. You can apply for this status. Now, the status basically says that if you're relying on gigs or projects to live off, whatever you don't make in a month to survive off, the state will then pay you that as a salary to make sure, well, you don't die and you make a livable wage. So they're fitting the bill. Now, to qualify for this, first of all, you have to be obviously legally working in France. And over the 10-month period previous to when you send your application off, you have to do 507 hours of work in your field. Okay, so if you're paid by the hour, like a rehearsal, easy, you put it down, I did two hours rehearsal, and that builds up towards your 507. If you're paid a one-off fee for a gig with an indiscriminate amount of hours, usually that goes down as 12 hours, okay? So once you get this, and you're accepted into the Antimitant du Spectacle series, or status, you have eight months that lasts for. In those eight months, whatever you make every month, if it doesn't come up to be at the national minimum wage for a full-time worker, the government will pay the rest. So that means also, if you do 
fuck all work for eight months you can't get a single gig you will still be making the national minimum wage every month so let's say in january you go in and you only make 200 quid that month for three gigs because something's happened and you just didn't get any gigs well that's grand the french state will pay you another what grand just to make sure okay you're not too fucked here you would be all right it's a very french thing now it used to be better than this to be honest it used to be a lot more money and it. it used to be 507 hours over a year but you can thank macron for that emmanuel macron is a prick internationally everyone loves him he's like oh he's so left wing in france it's so pretty european no macron is right he's a right wing politician just for international taste he's left but you have to remember generally french politics are a shift to the left compared to anywhere else the two big socialist countries in the western world are france and ireland so the politics are generally over to the left for france macron is right wing most people only vote for macron these days because it's to keep out that witch Marine le pen he's still a snake though but 200,000 people or so have the status now in France this year. It's amazing. It means artists don't have to take a side job. They can just concentrate on their craft and bring more stuff to the table and contribute to a very, very vibrant scene. So, the arts is alive and well in France. It's alive and kicking, baby. Nobody's putting the French down when it comes to the arts. And here, Paris is Paris. Paris is always Paris. If you know where to look, you'll get some great flute. Okay, you'll find some beautiful flute playing. But like everything in Paris, you have to know. You have to know the wee secrets. You know, it's like these tourists that come over and they go to like the fucking Eiffel Tower or Disneyland. And they're like, well, French food isn't that good. I had a baguette from the Eiffel Tower and it was terrible. Of course it was. French people wouldn't be seen dead in these places. I lived in Paris for three years. I only went to that area around the Eiffel Tower if I was showing someone around. Apart from that, I had no desire. It's the worst hellhole in Paris. Prisons would rather die. And when it comes to food, by the way, if you're in Paris, if the menu is in English, walk out. It's shit. Learn how to ask for your food in French. It's not hard. Don't order. Don't. If it has an English menu, you're cooked, boy. You're cooked. But if you do find yourself in Paris, here's everything. Try that one more time. If you do find yourself in Paris, here's everything a flute player needs to know about gay Paris. Orchestras. Now... I've talked about the French music education system in that French flute episode. Go listen to that. I'm not going to talk about conservatoires. There are performances at conservatoires. That's not for now, okay? We're going to talk about what's actually happening right now in Paris. So, orchestrally, there are six full-time professional orchestras in Paris at the moment. That is the Orchestre de Paris. The Orchestre de Paris. I'm trying to say this in both languages. But, you know, the Orchestre National de France, that is the National Orchestra of France. The Orchestre National de l'Ile de France, the National Orchestra of the Ile de France of the Greater Parisian Region. Uh, there is the Orchestre Philharmonique de Radio France, the Radio France Philharmonic Orchestra. There is the Opéra National de Paris, the Paris Opera, which actually has two orchestras. And there is the Orchestre de Chambre de Paris, which is the Chamber Orchestra of Paris. There's your six full-time professional orchestras in Paris. Now, there's three part-time orchestras. There is the Orchestre Padelou, the Orchestre Amoureuse, and the Orchestre Cologne. Then there are full-time professional ensembles. People like Ensemble Anticontemporain, which is the uh, contemporary music ensemble. They're very good. Sophie Cherrier plays flute with them. Unbelievable. Then there's also like Les Arts Florisons, L'Orchestre Champs Élysées, Le Concert Spiritueuse, all these like historical instrument things. So they're all there too. Now, the venues. This is where you should really be looking at. If you want to go to a concert, check out the venues. There's a lot in Paris. And it can be quite overwhelming to know which one's which. So it's okay. Inline G's got you. The first one, the Philharmonie de Paris, the Philharmonie, okay? That is the venue for orchestral music in Paris. It's kind of new, like 2015. Incredible venue. It's up in the 19th arrondissement in Paris. Kind of a shithole area. It's where I used to live. It's right beside the Paris Conservatoire as well. It is the venue, not just for local orchestras, but for guest orchestras. It's one of the best venues in Europe. It has a capacity of 2,400 people. It is the place to go. After that, you have the Salle Playel. That is in the 8th arrondissement which has a capacity of 1,913 people. There is the Salle Gavou, which is also in the 8th arrondissement, 1,020 people. There is the Salle Cotto, C-O-R-T-O-T, -T, after uh, Alfred Cotto, the pianist. That is attached to the École Normale de Musique de Paris, where I studied. It's in the 17th arrondissement. That is a call for chamber music, okay? And it's a capacity of 400 people. There's the Théâtre de Champs-Élysées, which is, of course, on the Champs-Élysées. Uh, that has a capacity of nearly 2,000 people. That's where the Rite of Spring riot was. That's in Champs-Élysées. Uh, then there's two opera houses. There is the Opera Bastille, which is on the roundabout at the Bastille. 
It's the big fancy one. It looks like that planet that Obi-Wan Kenobi goes to in Attack of the Clones. Kimono. Kimino. <laughs> Kimono's what the Japanese lads were. Kimino. Obi-Wan Kenobi does not wear a kimono. Although the nah. Jedi robes do look a wee bit like a kimono. But anyway, Kimino, it looks like that. It's very fancy. It looks like a spaceship. It's amazing. Then that's where they'll show operas like Wagner and modern operas. Or later operas. Then there's the Palais Garnier or Opera Garnier, which used to be a palace where the French king lived. Now it's an opera venue. It's the historic one. It's all gold. It's where all the perfume adverts are. Incredible building. They'll tend to do more things like Donizetti, pre-Donizetti operas in there. But they run at the same time. Now, they both have... Bastille has a capacity of 2,745. And Garnier has a capacity of 1,979. Big places. And the last venue is Maison de la Radio. The radio building where Radio France is based. That's on the 16th R&D Small. It's got a capacity of 1,461. It's also got recording studios, etc., etc., and two orchestras based there. It's incredible. That's the one you should check out first. If you can only do one, do that one for many reasons. But as a flute player, there's something very important down there. So the 16th R&D Small, one of the nicer ones in Paris. By the way, the R&D Smalls are the 20 districts. There's 20 of them in Paris. They're divided up. That's now R&D Small. The 16th has a street just by 10 minute walk from the Maison La Radio, the media house, where it's called Avenue Mozart. You go down Avenue Mozart, you will find a little plaque on the wall to Mr. Jean-Pierre Rampal. He lived on Avenue Mozart. Of course he fucking did. So you'll find a little plaque. You find these plaques all around Paris of different artists, people like Hemingway and Fitzgerald, Oscar Wilde, James Joyce. They all have plaques. Rampal has one as well. And there is a boulangerie, a bakery, just around the corner called La Flute Enchantée, the magic flute, which is obviously a homage to Rampal and to Mozart. There's a great picture actually of Rampal playing a baguette like a flute outside a brilliant and it's a delicious boulangerie. You can go there and then walk five minutes down to the Maison Radio to watch your concert. Bingo, bango, boingo. Now, orchestras. We'll go through them all, okay? I'll let you know what the crackers with them because it's overwhelming and you want to understand what's going on in the orchestral scene in Paris at the minute or even if you're not going to Paris and you just want to brag to your mates and show off how much you know, Inline G's got you. I'm nothing if not a shite talker. So, we're going to go through the orchestras, who they are, what they do, where they play, what they play, who their flute players are, and most importantly, how much it costs. How much of your hard-earned dollars you have to give over to them. So the first orchestra, the Orchestre de Paris. The Orchestre de Paris. That is the big name orchestra in Paris. Now, the principal conductor at the minute is Klaus Michaela. He is a young Finnish conductor. He's fantastic. Klaus is brilliant. Like, fantastic. Now, the Orchestre de Paris is based at the Philharmonie, as we talked about earlier. They don't have a set day for their concert, so it's not like Friday night is Orchestre de Paris night. They're sort of all over the place because the Philharmonie has something going on every night. Now, the Orchestre de Paris generally specialise with the classics, the big hits, the big, you know, like your your Tchaikovsky's, your Ravel's, your Zvorzak's, your Mozart's, your Beethoven's, all the big, proper, symphonic repertoire, the classics. You'll get that. There's a lot of French music. You get a lot of Ravel, a lot of Debussy, a lot of that stuff. You're not going to get obscure or contemporary works of the Orchestre de Paris. You're going to get what you want. It's a great orchestra. And they're the best orchestra if you want to see, like, a famous conductor as a guest or a famous soloist. They all go to the Orchestre de Paris. Okay, that's where you're going to get, like, I think tonight the um, recording this is Katia is playing with them. She often plays with them. You get know, all the big conductors. You know, Daniel Harding was the conductor before. Huge fan of him. But if you're looking for a big superstar soloist, go to the Orchestre de Paris. That's who you're going to find. Now, they're flute players. They have two principal flutes who job share. That's a common thing in France because they pay their flutes properly. So it means they do 50% of the contracts each. Depending on what night you go, you'll get one and you might get the other. Luckily, of all the orchestras in this list, they're all brilliant. So at the Orchestre de Paris, you have two lads. You have Vincent Lucas. I hope you're off when you have Vincent. One of the, I don't want to say older players on the scene, but one of the more experienced players. One of the players who's been around on the orchestral Principal flute scene in Paris for the longest. He's been about a while now, Vincent. He's amazing. I mean, it's Vincent Lucas. He's a household name nearly at this point. Or you'll get Vicente Prats, who I've talked about on this podcast as well. I didn't know he was Spanish. Rafael told me that um, in that episode with him. Great player. And on second flute, there was meant to be a drum roll. That's not a fucking drum roll. 
We have Bastian Pella and Florence Souchard Delepine, who I'm a huge fan of. She actually teaches at the CNSM as well, the Paris Conservatoire. And then on Piccolo, you have Anise Benoit, who's also wonderful. Now, how much is it going to cost you to go to the Orchestra Paris? 12 to 80 euros per ticket, depending on where you sit and if you have a discount. Last minute tickets are available, though, and this is the thing for all these orchestras. You can get last minute tickets. Go to the, ba the bakery, the billetterie, the ticket office. 30 minutes before it opens, so 30 minutes before the concert starts, this opens. Go a bit earlier, get in the queue. For the Orchestre de Paris, your tickets will be 12, 20, or 30 euro, depending on what category of concert it is. Or, if you are under 28, if you're under 28, go to fucking Paris, okay? Because everything's cheaper. The trains are cheaper. All the museums are free. Every single museum is free if you're under 28. They have a huge push to get young people into the arts. If you're under 28... All the tickets for the Orchestre Paris last minute are 11 euro. I mean, hello. And you get good seats with it sometimes. Now, the next orchestra, the Orchestre National de l'Île de France. L'Île de France is a region. It translates to the island of France. It's a region in, Par in France. The region is basically the greater Paris region. So this is the national orchestra for the greater Parisian region. It does include Paris, but they don't gig in Paris as much. Now, their principal conductor is Casé Scaglione, and he's obviously great. And they play around the Ile de France, but sometimes in Paris. Sometimes. Now, Paris is small. This is why this is important to mention, this orchestra. there's So, Paris itself, we call it Paris même in French. It's where, it's the actual 20 arrondissements, or 20 districts. That's the only ones that we count as actual Paris. Even though people who live in the suburbs are handy to Paris. Like, I lived in a suburb in my last year called Alphaville. It was one stop ahead on the Line 8. One stop. And it wasn't a Paris postcode anymore. But, I mean, one stop is three minutes away on the train. It was like a two-minute walk to Paris. But the postcodes in Paris all start with 750, and then you're around these months. So 01, 02, 19, 20. Parisians are very picky about that. But the Ile de France is close. So to go across Paris, it's only like 45 minutes you'll get across Paris in the train. The Ile de France is close. And off, if you're check, staying in Paris, check your hotels. You can be much closer to where these guys are getting. So these guys go around a load of different venues, Pretty much circling around the Ile de France, going around Paris, doing lots of gigs. They play the big classics, they do a lot of outreach concerts, they do a lot of music, uh, world music, operas, all that kind of fun stuff. They have an amazing flute section. Actually, one of my favourite flute sections in this. They have two principal flutes. Actually, I think their entire section is female. Two principal flutes, it's Hélène Giraud and Sabine Reino. I'm huge fans of both of them. I'm trying to get them on the podcast, we'll see. Charlotte Bleton is on second flute and Nathalie Rosa is on piccolo, who I'm a huge fan of. Now, basically, just go look up where they're touring. You might find a venue near them. Their tickets are much cheaper because they're playing different kind of venues. Smaller venues as well where you can get great seats right beside the orchestra. Usually, 25 euro max for a ticket. I mean, hello. Go. Now, next orchestra, the Orchestre Chambre de Paris, the Chamber Orchestra of Paris. Who's in charge? It is Thomas Hengelbrock. Now, he's German, obviously. They're a chamber orchestra. They also gig all over Paris. They're technically an artist in, or ensemble in residence at the Philharmonie, but they don't gig there that often. They're gigging everywhere. And they do a lot of tours internationally, but they're gigging everywhere because they can play smaller venues. So they play a lot of Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, all that stuff. Again, an all-female flute section. Do it for the girls. We have Marina Chamolegui and Liselotte Schreck. Uh, Marina is actually playing a flute concerto soon, in February. She's playing the Mozart G concerto with that orchestra. Now... Tickets for them usually range from 10 to 64 euro, depending on where you sit. Under 28, your tickets are 10 euro, you lucky bastards. Um, and if you're staying in a fancy area in Paris, if it's a big trip, they often play in the theatre, the Théâtre Champs Elysees or the Salle Gavo, both around those fancy areas. So check them out. Now, the next orchestra is a couple of inline G favourites coming up here, my dudes, but just quickly before then. Uh, regular listeners, skip ahead a minute, you know the crack. But everyone else, hang about a second, let me get my ears around you. Ah, the Inline G podcast is free. It always will be free, that is a guarantee. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address. And for the audio listeners, it's patreon.com forward slash the Inline G flute podcast. It'll cost you five quid a month, five euros a month. And with that, you are genuinely keeping this podcast alive and kicking. You get four episodes a month of this podcast, minimum. Every Friday, come rain or fucking shine, I deliver. Now, if you listen to a lot of them, you think, fuck, five, four to five episodes a month. Oh, I buy Gareth a pint at the end of the month to say thank you for that because I enjoyed that free entertainment. 
you can send me a fiver online. Happy days. Now, I do everything. This is the definition of an independent podcast. I do everything around here on my own. Literally, every aspect of this is just in line G here. Just the big man. Toiling away over a hot stove. If you become a patron, it helps generate a regular income for this podcast, meaning I can turn down other work to focus more on it. And secondly, and most importantly, I can tell sponsors to go and fuck themselves. Because sponsors do not like me saying what I just said. I can't swear, I can't talk about mental health, I can't talk about world politics, and I can't talk about anything dodgy in the industry. If I have a sponsor. But if you guys are sponsoring the podcast, they can go fuck themselves. I make the content you want, you get the content you want, Gareth gets a fiver. Happy days. Now... You don't get anything extra. I mean, you get like, I, I look after my patrons. You get like wee trading cards. You get the odd bit of merch. You get heavy access to stuff. And you get to interact with me a lot more. And to be honest, if you're a patron, I'm going to talk to you a lot more. And I like you a lot more. I'm going to listen to your opinions more. Patrons are the first people I go to if I need advice on the podcast. Because you guys are the ones that are paying for it. It's your podcast. But listen, if you can afford it, go sign up over there. It's five euros a month. And you can unsubscribe at any time. No fee. It's like an Apple subscription. Easy peasy. If you can afford it, it is hugely beneficial. Even if you just jump in for a month, hugely beneficial. But if you can't afford it, there's a cost of living crisis. Times are hard. It's all right. You can keep listening for free. Someone else is paying so that you don't have to. And also, buy my fucking merch, please. Look at these lovely t-shirts. Oh, this isn't a t-shirt. Actually, this isn't all sealed yet. But anyway, go check out the Inline G merchandise range. It is gorgeous. It's lovely. I make no money on it, lads. I break even on everything. But I love to see you all wearing it. That's nice stuff. Anyway, next op- orchestra is the opera. Oh, mummy. Here we go. There is one company in Paris for opera. It is called the Opéra National de Paris. Paris National Opera. Now, they have two buildings, as we talked about. Bastille and Garnier. Bastille and Garnier, if I'm going to say with that accent. Oh, my God. I have it. <laughs> I forgot to say this. I was trying to practice my French before I came on, see if I could do it with an Irish accent. And I remember Jimmy Galway spoke French. Have you guys ever heard James Galway speaking French? Because he spoke, he went on French TV back in the day. He speaks great French, like really good French, but he speaks with the same accent I do, which I fucking love. Listen to this, listen to this. Les pour danser. Et les joue l'accordion, mais les joue la flute dans une autre fife et tambour. Quelque chose comme ça. Et moi j'ai pris la fl- euh, ma première flûte, leçon de, de la flûte de mon père. Moi j'ai pris la première leçon de flûte de mon père. There you go, Jimmy. I love it. It's the same accent as me in English and in French. Belfast boys doing it hard. Big up the Jimmy. I probably should stop calling them Jimmy because they might keep this one under your hats, lads. But contact has been opened with the Galways. Contact has been started about a podcast with. Sir James and Lady Jean. Oh, funny. Keep that one quiet, though. Anyway, back to Paris Opera. The two buildings, you got the Bastille, which is the modern one. Does all the big, heavy, romantic stuff. Wagner, Schoenberg, all that kind of shit. Verdi. It looks like Attack of the Clones. And then you got Galnier. Does the classic stuff. Looks more like a palace. That's where you get your perfume ads filmed. Now, they also do symphonic concerts with the orchestra. The orchestra's brilliant. Okay, they're really, really good orchestra. And they do ballet, of course. There's something on every night. Every night, there's something on. They often split in two and do two different shows at the same place. So they have enough musicians to cover two full orchestras. They're incredible. Now, guest conductors come in all the time for Paris Opera. Obviously, guest singers come in too. But the main conductor and the director, musical director, is, of course, Dudamel. Gustavo Dudamel. So, fuck me. You're being spoiled with that. So there's always something on, including daytime shows. They do matinees as well. Now, it is expensive, right, lads? I'm not going to lie. It's expensive to go to the Paris Opera. This is the gem of Paris. This is where the great and the good and all their fancy dresses go, okay? You do have to dress up nice for it as well, especially if you're going to Gagnier. People really dress up for this shit. It is the best. So you have to pay a good bit for it. But I'll get to prices in a minute because what you're paying for, flute-wise, you have two principal flutes again. You'll be seeing either Frédéric Chateau, who is such a sweetheart, and an icon of French orchestral flute playing. Frédéric's been there for so long, and he is incredible. And the new principal flute, Iris Deverio. Fuck. I'm going to pronounce that. I'm going to check her name. I probably should have done this before. It is Deverio, isn't it? It is Deverio. Shouldn't have doubted myself. Um, she got the job recently after Paris Opera. We're looking for a new principal flute after my old teacher retired. Did a lot of auditions, but Iris is... Ah, oh, oh, man. 
So good. Now, second flute, you're also spoiled. You're going to get Claude Lefebvre, you're going to get Céline Nassi, or you're going to get Isabelle Pierre. Or, on Piccolo, you're going to get Sabrina Mahoufi or Almany Malata. So, again, nearly all females there who run the world girls, huh? This is all-star flute playing. No matter where you go to watch anything by Paris Opera, you will be getting a all-star flute cast. This is great. Now, let's talk about prices. Prices go from 15 euro at the shy places up to 180 euro for the nicer spots. Now, that's the average concert. It's nearly always so loud. Last minute tickets are available at Palais Garnier, where they do the old ones. That's the one you want to go to anyway, because it's the pretty one. Now, they're 10 euro, 30 minutes before, but they're limited view. I've done it. Sometimes you can see the stage. Great. Sometimes you can see fuck all, but you're in the room and you can hear it. It's 10 euro. Honestly, do it. Now, if you're under 28... Or if you're unemployed, officially, in France, not just, you can't just make it up. Or if you're over 65 and retired in France, you get cheap tickets for everything. You get 35 euro for any opera, 25 euro for any ballet, and a tenor for the Sunday Chamber Music Concert that they run at different points of the year. Check that out. Or, if you're just generally over 65, but you're not officially retired in France, if you're just over 65, 70 euro for any opera, 40 euro for any ballet or concert, and 15 for any chamber music concert. They also have a series called the Avant Première, which is why if you're under 28, you have to get on this. The Avant Première is a special night. It's a new initiative. It is before they do a new run of an opera. The very first night before opening night, they will do a one night only thing where it's only for people who are under 28. Now, it gets the full cast, the full cast. Every famous singer is there, the orchestra is there. It is done exactly the way it's done. There's nothing cheap in the about it, but it is subsidized by a bank to try and get young people involved in the opera. So the tickets are very, very cheap for that. They're like 10 euro, okay? They are brilliant, the Avon Pommiers. I went to so many of them when I was in Paris because, because these people don't go to the opera very often. Everyone's just wearing jeans and a t-shirt. My teacher said it was the best audience to play for because they just clap when they wanted to. It's full of young people. Everyone has a few drinks. It's fucking brilliant. So do it. Now, we're going to get... I've left the best for lads. Last year, lads. I've left the best for lads. Maison de la Radio, the radio house. Ah, oh, boys are there. If you do anything in Paris, go there. I'll be there next week. There are two orchestras in the Maison de la Radio, the radio. Now, Friday nights. If you go on a Friday, you're going to get, probably, the Orchestre Philharmonique de Radio France, the Radio France Philharmonic. If you go on a Saturday, you're going to get the Orchestre National de France, the National Orchestra of France, generally. Both of these orchestras are run by Radio France, the national broadcaster in France. And for years, there was rumours that they were going to form together. Even when I lived in Paris, there was protest by the musicians to make sure they did, the government didn't let them happen. I'm glad it didn't. I'm very fucking glad they didn't because these two orchestras are incredible, like some of the best in the world, and they're so different. They all rehearse in Maison de Radio. They all have the room. They all share it. Usually one orchestra in the morning, the other one in the afternoon. So why is there two orchestras? Why two distinct orchestras by Radio France? This is quite a common thing with radio orchestras, okay? So if you look at the BBC, for example, you have the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the BBC Concert Orchestra. Or the Vidier here in Cologne, you have the Vidier Symphony Orchestra and the Vidier Funkhaus Orchestra. Both, that's a common thing where RTE as well in Ireland, you have the National Symphony Orchestra in Ireland and the RTE Concert Orchestra. So basically you have one serious orchestra and one that does pop music or light music or, you know, that kind of stuff. That's the general gist of radio orchestras. Not the case in France, okay? They have the serious one, the Orchestre Nationale de France. So if you go watch the Orchestre Nationale, that's all the classics, all the big hits, big, heavy French stuff. They promote French music, French soloists, French culture. They do all the official state events where they need an orchestra. They play at the 14th of July Bastille Day show on the Eiffel Tower that's uh, televised in the whole of France. And they're conducted by Christian Macalaru, Macalaru, who is also playing, or playing, is the principal conductor of the Vidi Air Symphony Orchestra here in fucking Cologne. I should have asked him for a lift to Paris, because apparently he's always between the two. But flute players in the National Orchestra of France, mummy, mummy, mummy. So on piccolo, you're going to get Edouard Zabou. Second flute is Patrice Kirchhoff, also great, okay, but the first flutes, there's three, okay. Josephine Poncelin de Rocourt, great player, ah, tender, sweet, elegant flute sound. Or you're going to get Michel Moagas, who's one of my all-time favourite flute players. For me, he's the epitome of that French style of playing. Um, Michel's great. 
don't think he plays as much now. I could be wrong on that, but Michel is amazing. Or you could get Sylvia Caradou, who we all know. Sylvia is Sylvia. I mean, Jesus Christ. You can watch Sylvia Caradou play the flute. Like, fuck me. Go and do it. Also, official confirmation, Sylvia Caradou is coming on in line G. Not next week, unfortunately, but we've been talking. She'll be on. Sylvia Sylvia. I mean, Jesus Christ. So, that's what you get if you watch the National de France. If you go to the other side of the Maison, we have the non-serious orchestra who is more serious. They were founded in 1937, the Radio France Philharmonic. And originally it was meant to be an orchestra that would do all the kind of concerts that the National Orchestra wouldn't do. Lighter stuff, stupid stuff, but... Not stupid, but you know, lighter, more chilled stuff. But they had a musical director called Gilbert Ami, or Gilbert Ami, in the 70s. And that was when they started becoming known as specialists in avant-garde and contemporary music. As well as really becoming good at the French uh, impressionist kind of stuff. You know, Debussy Havel. Then Myung Won Chung conducted the orchestra from 2000 to 2015 and turned it around. He turned that orchestra into one of the best orchestras on the planet. Honestly, in my opinion, top three orchestras in the world, especially under Chung, they were electric. That orchestra was insane. Now, it's my favorite orchestra in the world, okay, for many reasons, but that is my favorite orchestra in the world. They specialize now in Wagner and Buchner and all that heavy stuff and contemporary music, especially contemporary music. Every season with the Radio France Philharmonic, there are 25 minimum premieres. Brand new works premiered. Now, back in the day, it was intended to be a backup orchestra to the National de France. Now it's its own beast. It's this insane orchestra. So the current principal conductor is Miko Franck, the uh, Finnish guy. He's been there nearly 10 years now, Miko. Um, but the flutes, oh, this is why I love this orchestra. So on piccolo, you have Anne Sophie Nevis, who is one of the sweetest women in the world. And I wish she was confident with her English because I would adore to have her on this podcast. She's a very good friend. And I would love to have her on, but she doesn't speak English. Maybe I'll do a French version. And an amazing piccolo player. Proper orchestral piccolo player. Knows her shit. It's also a job share. There's Justine Caillé, who I don't know personally yet, but I've heard her play many times. I mean, hello. Uh, on second flute, we have one guy. Normally, it's normally Michel, Michel Rousseau, who is the epitome of a great second flute. He's the kind of... I think half the reason why the principal flutes in this orchestra sound so good is because Michel is making them sound good. He's doing the work that doesn't get the accolades, but his level, the balance and the solidity he provides, he just knows his role so well and he does it to a T. And he props up the two principal flutes. Again, job shared. You're either going to get Mathilde Calderini, who's been there for a few years now, one of the great young flute players in France. Mathilde is, you know, if anyone's seen her, you know. Go check her out online. Mathilde is one of the great young flute players in France. Or. This doesn't sound fair, neither comparing them, but... Or you're going to get my favourite flute player in the entire planet, bar none, Magali Mounier. That is the best flute player in the world, in my opinion. She's my favourite. I love her to bits. I cannot talk enough about how much I love Magali and her orchestra. When she's playing in that orchestra with Miko conducting, it is heaven. Absolute heaven. So, go. The prices at the Radio France are 10 to, si 10 to 67 euro, depending on where you sit. Now you can buy a passion, if you're under 28, for 28 euro, and you get four concerts with that. Honestly, buy it and just use it for two concerts if you're there in a week. Because you get one orchestra in one night, one in the other. And you've already saved money, okay? Or last minute tickets, as always, 30 minutes before, rock up. They're going to be 10 or 15 euro. Sorry, 10 or 25 euro, depending on which category for everybody. Now, before we just run out here, that's all the orchestras in Paris, the main ones. I'm just going to give you a couple of last minute things that you can enjoy while you're in Gay Paris. Guest orchestras. Philharmonie. Every night, there's a new orchestra there. I've seen every fucking orchestra in the world at the Philharmonie. I've seen all the big Americans. I've seen the Berlin Orchestra. I've seen the Russian Orchestra. I've seen the London Symphony Orchestra. They're always there. The usual discounts are on. And they always have that last minute 12 euro ticket. Go down there. And if you're early, go down to the Philharmonie. There's a bar across the way called Le Local. It's a rock bar. It has very cheap pints of very terrible French beer. And it's great. Go there. Uh, Salcotto, as I talked about earlier, were attached to the Economale. People forget about it. It has wonderful chamber music. It's well funded as well. They've got good money in there. Go check it out. Uh, check out the websites for all the different uh, concert venues that I said at the start, especially places like the Théâtre des Champs Elysees. So on the Champs Elysees, they often do chamber music there as well on Sunday mornings. I've seen Emmanuel Bayou play there about four or five times. So it's worth looking at. Now, where to look for tickets as well? There is a couple of websites. There's parisconcerts-tickets.com. Paris Concerts 
hyphen tickets.com that's where you get all the big orchestras the main shows if you're looking for something a little bit more niche and indie you can go to classic tick.com classic and then tick spelled t-i-c dot com okay now for example i'm recording this on a wednesday on this wednesday night there's three chamber music concerts alone in the city center of paris for under 15 euro aside from all the big orchestras so it's always worth looking at also check out the Église de la madeleine the madeleine church madeleine church great okay now other people i have to shout out flutes because you should go follow these people and see what they're doing in and around paris because these are the people that live in paris friends of inline g okay uh rachel rachel ombredan who's with rossway music she'll be coming on the podcast she's brilliant if you want to see flute done in a different way with a fucking rocking band and some great originals some great covers rossway are often gigging in paris so hit up rachel check her instagram out daniela mars is in paris as well she's often gigging around there check her out again she'll be coming on the podcast next week and ensemble imago okay thomas tavares was on this podcast before they often gig in paris as with tomas as a soloist go check him out other places le duc de lombard it's a jazz bar okay go to the fucking jazz bar lads smoke a bit of reefer and go down to the jazz bar it's in chatelet chatelet is the the area where there's, there's one street okay there's one street where it's all there it's just of rue saint denis and it's all the jazz bars literally facing each other now the bars are free in you get some of the best jazz players in the world in there the drinks are expensive so what i do is i watch the set and then i go out for a cigarette i don't take a cigarette i go to the irish bar next door called the hide and they have three euro pints i sink one of them and then I go back in and watch the show happy days so go check that out and obviously, uh, Aria Music, Aria Music, Aria, A-R-I-A, is the place to go to check out instruments. Philippe Roland is the guy that runs that shop. It's a shop and he repairs instruments. He's one of the leading flute repair guys in the world. He's developed his own pads. He's a genius, okay? Let Philippe know you're coming if you want or just pop by. He's got a brand new shop out in the 15th hour. He's it's great. And Rue de Rome. That is where you will get all your scores. It's by St. Lazare Station. Rue de Rome is a must-see for a music fan. You walk out and it's a shop, 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 shop of music stores that sell classical sheet music. Go do it. Now, hopefully, that is enough to keep you all entertained in Gay Paris for the flute, for flute entertainment. Jesus Christ. That's Betsy hitting me hard. That's enough to keep you entertained, I hope. Or if you're not going to Paris and you just imagine you were, there you are. You can brag about it to your mates about all the different orchestras. But go and listen to these guys. Go and check these orchestras out. Go and listen to the differences in the sounds with them. That's one of the funnest things to do. Even start with the Orchestre Nationale de France and the Orchestre Philharmonique de Radio France. Go listen to those two orchestras side by side. Check out their videos on YouTube. A lot of videos because it's all filmed by the radio house. Go and compare them. See what you think about their sounds, their flute pairs, what they're doing differently. They're amazing orchestras. My general routine now is when I get up in the mornings, if I'm doing like emails and shit like that, I will leave one of those orchestras on, on my TV in the background every day just because there's always great stuff coming up um other things you have to do in paris don't forget go get a sandwich from a boulangerie from a bakery go in and get a jambon beurre sandwich it sounds shit because it's just butter and ham but it's incredible french butter and incredible ham it would blow your mind how good it is so get that one drink an espresso at a bar go to a cafe and go up to the bar and order your espresso don't sit down outside like a mug you'll be charged three times more Go to the bar, stand at the bar, order an espresso, give them one euro and drink it and fuck off. It's typically French. And of course, for the love of fuck, do not listen to the French on this. Listen to your man in 9G. Get a French taco. French tacos are amazing. They're nothing like actual tacos. There's no lime. There's no crispy shell. A French taco is basically where they get like a big wrap, like a tortilla wrap, and they put chips in it, or fries for my American friends. They put cheese in it. They put a cheese sauce and they put three fillings of your choice usually sausages chicken nuggets cordon bleu or kebab meat and they put two sauces on it and they toast it and they give it to you it's the most non-french thing even though it was invented in france in Lyon, they're amazing go do it and all that should keep the paris syndrome at bay now i was trying to work out an ending here for this podcast and i chat gpt did for the first time in my life and this is the end of the chat gpt has given me And there you have it, folks. The flute and orchestral scene in Paris, where every corner is filled with history, every concert hall echoes with brilliance, and every flutist is probably stuck in line for a croissant after a rehearsal. But hey, if you can master circular breathing, you can definitely handle the weight. Whether you're dreaming of playing at the Philharmonie or just hoping to play without accidentally spinning on your stand partner, Paris is the place to be. So until next time, may your high notes soar, your reeds behave, and may you always remember, in Paris... Everything sounds a little bit. Everything sounds better with a little bit of je ne sais quoi. 
even your scales. Bonsoir and happy practicing. And then it's got in brackets, cue a playful flute trill to close. Do you know when I say that? Shite. <laughs> Shite. Fuck chat GPT, GPT. I don't care what it is. Man, don't be nervous about chat GPT, okay? The thing's a fucking idiot. All right, just take the plug out. What's it going to do? Huh? My, <laughs> the robot overlords can go fuck themselves. Go to Paris, smoke a big reefer, and go watch some jazz music. I love you all so much. I will see you next week. I think it's going to be a guest episode, and then another guest episode, and probably another guest episode, because I'm going to be drinking red wine in Paris as of next week. Not the day this comes out, but the week after. I love you all. Au revoir, mes potes, mes petits rats. Bisous.